Dragonflight is ready. It's easy to be pessimistic about PvP right now. We get it, but there are reasons to be excited and reasons to be curious about what Dragonflight has to offer. While skepticism is understandable, Dragonflight has tremendous potential for PvP. Between the new talent system and ranked solo shuffle, it could be the biggest shakeup that PvP has seen in a long time. The PvP meta is far from solved going into launch, and none of this Wrath Classic stuff though, where your best talents were figured out a decade ago. This guide isn't about what's best, but about arming you with the knowledge to make an informed decision on what class and specs will speak to you in Dragonflight. By now you should be familiar with our archetypes for damage and healers. These are categories we use to signal the playstyle and vibe of a given spec. On one end of the spectrum, we have the Tactician, or the Carry, which emphasizes control and structure, like Subtlety Rogue or Fire Mage. This archetype came to define most of Shadowlands PvP. On the other hand, we have the Brawler, or Wizard, who prefer to take a momentum-based approach. This is your Fury Warrior or Affliction Warlock, who just want to go crazy until the Carpal Tunnel sets in. For healers, we have our interactive and non-interactive styles. This is to do with interacting with the enemy team. Some healers thrive when they're able to sit in the back and crank some lo-fi beats. Others, they just want to push in on the enemy team and land crowd control or spam those purges. And what's interesting about Dragonflight is how it challenges our system in established categories. Certain specs have only been played one way for a long time now, but almost all specs have the potential to shift toward, if not embrace, their opposing archetype. And just before we jump in, you're going to be seeing a lot of talent trees in this video. Be sure to check out our articles at skillcap.com for the most up-to-date builds and strategies for your spec by following the link in the description below. Also, if you're looking to crush at this expansion, then one of the best times to get seriously good at Arena is before the season even starts. This is an excellent opportunity for y'all to enroll in our academy courses and master the fundamentals of what makes a rank one player the best. And the best part is you'll get to practice all these lessons, new talents, add-ons, etc., before Arena actually starts in mid-December. Prior to the season starting is where there's literally no consequence if you lose. So you can just focus on improving and executing our high-level concepts we teach you on our site. Then, when Arena comes out, you'll have significantly improved your fundamentals, and this is when we start flooding our website with class guides we've spent tons of time creating with the best players, where you'll learn how to smash your arena games and solo shuffle by topping damage, healing, and so much more. So consider signing up at Skillcapped right away. There's literally zero risk with our refund guarantees. Anyway, let's get right into it. There's a ton to be excited for with Death Knights and Dragonflight. The DK class trees are among the best of the bunch, and we're confident that you won't regret maining a Death Knight. Frost has been left out in the cold in recent years. For multiple expansions, Frost has been limited to a single playstyle entirely reliant on cleave setups. These one and two minute setups were extremely predictable, and outside of those windows, the Frost DK posed no threat at all. Frost Death Knight has had its moments during this era, but it never felt good to play or play against. We categorized Frost as a brawler, but it's been stuck with the worst elements of a tactician, which never really felt right for it. Which is why it's exciting to say that Dragonflight returns Frost to a true brawler, where it's always felt most at home. Its Shadowlands chill streak archetype remains accessible, but we imagine most players will be far more interested in this single target Pillar of Frost archetype. Ice Cap solves Frost's biggest problems, which was its predictable and rigid setups. Frost can now desync Pillar from enemy cooldowns, and they're incentivized to stay in and maximize the value of Ice Cap's Pillar of Frost CDR. Oh. And if that's not enough, Two-Handed Frost could be back for the first time in years and can be incorporated into this archetype effortlessly. Unholy has historically been defined by consistent pressure and its ability to oppress the enemy. It may be one of the most compelling trees to talk about because it has so many potential archetypes. It's the perfect example of what we'd want to see from these new trees in Dragonflight. Each core element of Unholy has an archetype that supports it and provides a different type of damage. You can create entire builds around minions, death coil, diseases, or festering wounds, 
but these builds can also be blended to create numerous different variations. Like Frost, quite a few of these builds resemble a return to Unholy's traditional archetype as an oppressive brawler. And like Frost, Unholy now has the ability to use Blinding Sleep, which can pair with Strang and Asphyxiate to create an unreasonable CC chain on a 60 second cooldown. Unholy can play for setups as a minion build, it can play for Rot Pressure as Disease, or consistent single target damage with Festering Wounds. In that sense, this flexibility is valuable because it means that Unholy gets at least 4 bites at the cherry. Next up, Demon Hunter. Havoc has typically been seen as a classic brawler, defined by consistent high pressure with lightning fast mobility and high meta uptime, providing high amounts of leech. It combines that brawler playstyle with some powerful utility, such as reverse magic, darkness, and spectral sight. Havoc's classic meta uptime archetype remains well developed. Havoc gains access to a bunch of vengeance tools, notably their sigils. Sigil of Misery can be paired with Imprison, just like the Mana Rift days, but as an effortless CC chain. Dragonflight appears to be shifting away from high meta uptime for Demon Hunters. A meta-based build like this one still appears quite effective, but many Havoc players have been gravitating toward a more burst-oriented build with Essence Break. Though, in the pre-patch, with Bork Tuning, we also saw the potential power of an any means necessary build, based around high ranged and consistent cleave damage. Defensively, Havoc remains strong into consistent caster damage due to its high leech and passive magic damage reduction. Fodder to the Flame adapts the Necrolord passive effect, which can also be used by the DH as a form of on-demand healing. With the current state of tuning, Havoc looks set to be very successful. Druids are, of course, the game's big hybrid class. With four specializations, it can perform any role. There have been criticisms of the Druid's class tree in Dragonflight, but putting those aside, there's stuff to be excited about. The new Dragonflight tree may leave Druids with a smaller toolkit than they had in Shadowlands, but in return, provides much greater flexibility to sculpt your toolkit to your needs. You know the drill at this point. Feral Druids have a reputation for being among the hardest classes to play. Their damage rotation has a lot going on. Their hybrid design demands a lot of keybinds compared to something like a Demon Hunter, and Feral Druids are very susceptible to being trained and becoming stuck in bear form, unable to get their pressure rolling. Feral Druids ask a lot of the player, but Dragonflight is an exciting time for Feral Druids. Feral Druids were incredibly powerful for most of Shadowlands, and Jungle Cleave represented a top-tier comp for the entirety of the expansion, and it might make a return. Their signature archetype, a single-target bleed build with Adaptive Swarm, is supported by the talent tree. Though they have lost Sickle of the Lion, this build boasts crazy DOT pressure on a single player, and once this damage is rolling, peeling the Feral doesn't do much to mitigate the pressure. Though it costs 7 points to pick up, Astral Influence is an incredibly powerful talent for Ferals. It's seen play as part of a rot-based bleed build that applies dots to the entire team. Feral Druids, ask a lot of you, but if you're willing to put in the work, we expect Dragonflight to reward you with a compelling experience, but more importantly, rating. The game will reward you with rating. Balance is a ranged caster specialization for Druids. In Season 4 of Shadowlands, we categorized them as a carry. They were defined by strong personal defensives, powerful crowd control, and deadly 60-second setups. They had a remarkable toolkit for PvP. But tragically, it's Thanksgiving season, so Blizzard made a meal of our beloved wizard turkey. The elements that made it strong still exist, but just aren't as strong for one reason or another. This comes down to the new design of Eclipse, which encourages hardcasting spells during their burst damage, when Moonkins were previously able to spam instant casts. They may be transitioning from a carry towards a wizard, playing less like a fire mage and more like an affliction lock. This is a pretty significant change that may make them feel less powerful. However, none of this necessarily makes balance a poor choice. Restoration Druid is a healing spec based primarily around heal over time effects. They're a hybrid between interactive and non-interactive healers. They don't always want to hang back, they can't always be in the enemy's face. As a Resto Druid, you need to bend the breeze, you know, like a tree. 
Their biggest contribution to their team's offense is through their CC, typically Cyclone. In the 2v2 bracket, it's been common to see Resto Druids run Feral Affinity in order to access Rake and Maim. This was typically a huge defensive trade-off in exchange for huge offensive value. One of the benefits of the Druid Clash tree is that Resto Druids can pick up Rake, including its stun component, for only a single point. This means they can play a typical Guardian Affinity build, but keep the ability to re-stealth and stun into Cyclone. As we covered in our preview, Life Bloom looks to be significantly more potent than it has been in the past, due to a ton of talent that support it. Verdant Infusion remains a potent form of single-target healing. Resto Druids also receive a new talent, Invigorate, which is another spin on the Genesis concept that's cropped up in the R Druid kit over the years. On the whole, those familiar with Resto Druid will recognize what they're seeing. Resto's flying under the radar at the moment, but it's likely that good R Druid play will be rewarded in Dragonflight. Evoker is the new hero class introduced in Dragonflight. They're the first new class to be introduced to the game with a ranged DPS specialization. When you first pick up an Evoker, there's an immediate similarity to Demon Hunters, but with a much greater difficulty. Evokers embody a similar action-oriented playstyle. Despite being a caster, Evoker's core idea is mobility. You're flying around, casting while moving, teleporting, it's crazy. To attempt to balance their mobility, Healing Evokers have a maximum range of 30 yards on most of their spells, as opposed to the usual 40. This has probably been the most discussed aspect of the class as a whole. A core concept of Evoker is their empowered spells. Several abilities have levels to them, similar to a rogue's combo points, where their level is determined by how long you charge the spell. Evoker uses a resource system similar to the modern rune system of Death Knights. For us, though, the thing that really jumped out at us about Evoker is just how much utility they have in PvP. In our preview, we described Devastation as a cross between Demon Hunter and Elemental Shaman. This is a great way to describe the feel of the class. We already discussed the very action-y feel of Demon Hunters. The comparison to Elemental comes from their incredible mobility and snappy damage profile. It's hard to get an accurate read on where Devastation will land long term, though. At the moment, the build that's drawn the most attention is a 2-minute one-shot build. Through stacking damage amplifiers and tip the scales, Devastation is able to produce a brutal combo that could potentially global enemy players. We expect this to be a common theme to the class because of their mastery, Giant Killer, which causes Evoker to deal increased damage to targets closer to full health. It's an opposite of the Resto Shaman mastery. This makes for a spectacular clip, but a single two-minute trick shot doesn't make it an S-tier spec. As it stands, Dev relies on its burst setup so much because it's too vulnerable to hard cast. They need to kite to play for the setup, reminiscent of older caster playstyles. The thing to keep in mind, though, is that Evoker is the big shiny new class. We're confident Blizzard will continue to support it, even if it struggles at launch. Evoker is going to receive the kind of love that Shadow Priest could only dream of. Preservation is a healing specialization that feels unique in our existing healer system. On paper, Evoker can look like a non-interactive healer. It's possible to imagine an Evoker who stays at max range and heals, only pushing in to sleepwalk to continue a CC chain. In practice, Preservation's kit is constantly encouraging them to dive in even when not directly interacting with the enemy. They often find themselves in the thick of the fight and rely on a mix of preemptive and reactive healing. Preservation has the staples. It has a kick, a range CC, and can deal real damage, but Preservation feels distinct from the other interactive healers. Preservation also has just an unbelievable amount of defensive cooldowns. Far too many to talk about, but here's a list of every ability Prez has access to that we consider to be a defensive cooldown. You can learn more about them in our courses. Preservation is so much fun to play in PvP that we're expecting it to meaningfully improve arena queue times. People are going to want to heal on this thing. Hunters are a pure DPS class in the mold of Rangers. In Dragonflight, their three specs play very differently, but are underpinned by the same core ideas. Hunters build their offensive gameplay around Freezing Trap, which leads to structured setups around 25 to 30 seconds. 
They play with structure, but lack the control of something like Moonkin, so we consider hunters to broadly be a hybrid between brawlers and tacticians. In Shadowlands, Craven's stratagem was the defining element of Hunter's defense. This absurd ability hasn't made it into the new talent tree. However, Hunters do enjoy a whole bundle of defensive talents. For instance, Survival of the Fittest no longer requires a tenacity pet, allowing Hunters to access it without dropping Master's Call. Now let's talk about specs. Beast Mastery is a specialization based around pets and summoning additional temporary wild beasts to attack the target. Though BM is typically unpopular among senior hunter players, the spec has developed a lot in Dragonflight and is a lot more compelling than it has been in the past. This is through PvE legendaries from Shadowlands being folded in. The standout build for BM is a high-tempo build based in part around Dire Command and War Orders. This build takes advantage of the synergy between Kill Command and Barbed Shot to create a fast-paced build that generates a small army of angry dogs to hound the target. In terms of complexity, it's no feral druid, sure, but for players who haven't really looked at BM in a few years, you might be surprised. This archetype generates consistent high pressure from a diverse source of enemies. This makes it difficult for most classes to peel and the total mobility offered by BM allows them to chase targets down or harass healers at no damage loss. As the name implies, marksmanship hunters are themed around their ranged damage. Marksmanship has morphed into a kind of physical caster in modern WoW, and this meant that it struggled with line of sight and was often dependent on resonating arrowing to get out of pressure. Though they've lost that ability, Sentinel Owl is a fascinating alternative. You keep the ability to wall hack, but the ability has a dynamic duration related to the time since the ability was last used, which allows you to use it more or less often based on the situation or your playstyle. Rather than resonating arrow dictating 60 second setups, your damage dictates Sentinel Owl. The classic double tap true shot archetype will still be possible in Dragonflight, but we're curious to see what the removal of the PvP modifier to aim shot does to that build. The new Windrunner archetype offers more consistent damage with a chance to proc true shot, though it is admittedly unreliable, so we're keeping an eye on it. Tuning wise, Marks isn't drawing attention to itself on beta. Some PvEers expect MM to see buffs early in the expansion, and that may well propel MM into being a top-tier spec. Survival is a melee DPS hunter spec. We've been saying this for years, but it always felt a bit dishonest, since a key feature of survival has been its ability to do a huge portion of its damage from a distance. Tragically, survival finally had a good season in Keystones for the first time in history, and you know how it goes. The sirens went off at the Fun Police Headquarters in Irvine, California, and us PvPers got caught in the crossfire yet again. But there is good news. Not only has almost every talent on the Shadowlands talent tree made it into Dragonflight, but the vast majority of them can be played together with ease. What we're left with is a spec that doesn't have a ton of flexibility, but it's a juiced version of what we've seen in the last few years. The build that produces the most single target damage is based around Mongoose Bite. A huge portion of survival's damage comes from this one ability. This means survival hunters are now going to need to run into melee and throw down if they want to generate real pressure. The good news, Mongoose Bite works well with hunter's playstyle. It can feel a bit awkward at first, but it begins to make sense after some practice. Dragonflight's shaping up to be the expansion when survival hunter is at its most survival huntery. To those who don't like its melee playstyle, that's gonna be bad news. For those who like a mobile melee with a structured damage and tons of utility, survival is an obvious pick. Mage is a pure range damage class. Historically, mage specs have all had access to different tools for securing CC, and this has helped define the playstyle of each spec. Unfortunately, over the years, this has revealed some gaps between the mage specs. Dragonflight sees all three specs gaining access to Dragon's Breath, Ring of Frost, and even the new Mass Polymorph. On top of that, all mage specs now also have access to Ice Wall, Greater Invis, Blast Wave, just to name a few. We're predicting that this will open the door for other mage specs to thrive, and it'll break up the monopoly that Fire's held over the spec for most of the last few years. 
It's been almost half a decade since Arcane Mage was last truly a top tier spec, which is a shame because there's a lot of fun to be had on Arcane. Arcane's themed around high mobility and huge burst setups, both elements of Arcane that have been doled from their high point in Legion. Dragonflight returns a lot of that theme, and so Arcane Mage is set to be the strongest it's been in quite a while. A unique element of Arcane Mage is their mana. They're the only DPS class to use their mana as a true offensive resource. Of the new changes to the spec, Arcane gets a new offensive cooldown, Arcane Surge. This 90 second cooldown converts all your mana into damage before granting a massive mana regen and damage buff to you for 15 seconds. Arcane's burst has always been relying on casting, and unfortunately, Arcane Surge's 2.5 second cast suffers the same problem. This has always been Arcane's problem its susceptibility to interrupt in its single school of spells. Access to Dragon's Breath and Ring of Frost will help that quite a bit and enable the mage to get off some of those crucial casts. Despite that, Arcane Mage has looked lethal on the beta, and it's been tapped to be the top mage spec at launch. In our mage preview, we spoke about how Fire seemed to be losing its identity as a carry in favor of a shift towards being a wizard. Fire certainly has the potential to maintain a playstyle similar to its Shadowlands model, which is defined by big sub two minute combustions. This archetype isn't technically going away, but as we highlighted, other changes to the fire spec, such as the increased cooldown on Dragon's Breath, may cause the spec to see less success with its reheated Shadowlands leftovers. Fire's gained a lot of support for a less structured playstyle. The new PvP talent Glass Cannon makes Blizzard's intentions pretty clear. There's potential for a strong build themed around Fireball and Ignite. An archetype like this would lean for high, consistent pressure similar to what we saw from Elemental Shaman in the final months of Shadowlands. Fire as a spec remains incredibly powerful. Its toolkit has seen some nerfs, but it hasn't lost its core tools. We expect Fire to maintain its current ability to play as a carry, but may also use its newfound versatility to play as a wizard, closer to the vibe of what we have seen from Fire in Wrath Classic. Frost mages have had something of an identity crisis for a long time now. In PvP, its most iconic idea is Shatter. When a target is frozen, the mage deals a bunch more damage to them, allowing for lethal combos. However, area of effect abilities like Frozen Orb have come to dominate more and more of the Frost Mage kit, de-emphasizing Shatter's role, while the Frozen Orb archetype has been further bolstered by the Dragonflight tree. The new combination of Cold Front and Freezing Winds teases the possibility of a very dynamic Frozen Orb build that mixes cooldown reduction and cold front stacks to generate dangerous Frozen Orb goes at regular and unpredictable intervals. Frost Mage has solidified itself as being a double caster specialist, though the addition of Fire Breath does give it the ability to play more like a Fire Mage, so melee caster specs may end up enjoying Frost Mage, though we do feel that Frost is at its best when there's a second caster to draw some of the oppression away. Monks are a leather-wearing class with the ability to DPS and heal. And absolutely nothing else. Both Windwalker and Mistweaver have a lot in common and have gained similar advantages in Dragonflight, but both the specs are different enough that we're going to dive straight into the spec discussion. Windwalkers are a melee DPS. Thematically, they lift a lot of concepts from fighting games, such as combos and zoning. And like in a fighting game, a good Windwalker can often feel like a god amongst men. Windwalkers are notoriously squishy, but have a huge toolkit to survive if played well. Diligent play is essential to survive as a Windwalker. You need to know when the danger is coming and have a plan. With Dragonflight, Windwalkers have more defensive tools than ever before. In terms of support for your teammates, as Windwalker, you bring less disruption than a warrior or rogue, but Grapple Weapon and Ring of Peace can both single-handedly put out fires if used well. Modern Windwalkers build their offensive game entirely around the sweep setup, and it hit critical mass in Shadowlands with the Necrolord Windwalker build based on Kiefer Skyreach and Bone Dust Brew. Not only has this archetype made it into Dragonflight intact, Necro Windwalker looks to be as powerful as ever. However, Dragonflight also represents a chance for Serenity to make a comeback, which is all about enabling you to hit as many powerful buttons as possible in a 12-second window. 
It's a fan favorite, and you can bet that the big name Windwalkers are gonna fight to make it work. For all these reasons, we consider Windwalkers to be tacticians. They ask a lot of the player, but are extremely powerful and incredibly rewarding to those who have the ability to make the most of the class. Mistweaver is a healing specialization. In Arena, Mistweaver's standard playstyle is what we call non-interactive. They're at their most comfortable when they're able to stay back and keep themselves safe from enemy disruption. If a Mistweaver is allowed to sit back and do their thing, they can heal through basically any damage on their teammates. This isn't to say that you always sit back and just heal like you're in a dungeon. Mistweavers can and do take opportunities to land crowd control, and they love nothing more than landing a killing blow with touch of death. But their offensive game is kept in check by Mistweavers' biggest weakness, their tendency to die in stuns. Mistweavers are very, very squishy and can be trained into the ground, but it was typically the stuns that caused the most problems. Both the 9.1 PvP talent revamp and the Dragonflight tree have sought to address this issue. They have more disruption, they have more defensive cooldowns, and they can use their teleport while stunned. All of this is intended to make them an unappealing kill target, so you can understand why Mistweaver mains are so excited. In their current form, Mistweavers work best with double caster compositions. These are comps that can draw the attention away from the monk or protect the monk if teams do try and train you down. Paladins are a plate-wearing hybrid class with the ability to specialize in tanking, melee DPS, and healing. Dragonflight has been quite kind to Paladins. They gain quite a bit of additional utility. Paladins can now pick up an enhancement to Blessing of Sacrifice. Recompense is interesting, but Sacrifice of the Just is insane. A 60-second cooldown puts Blessing of Sacrifice in contention for the strongest external defensive in the game. Paladins now have access to the shortened cooldown on Hammer of Justice and a choice between Blinding Light and Repentance. This is a big buff for Paladin control. Lay on Hands is usable in Arena. At first glance, this is nuts, but Power Creep has seen Lay on Hands become less game-breaking than it used to be. With that said, it's still a free and reliable source of saving a player, so this should be something that Ret Paladins especially benefit from. Now let's talk about the specs. Retribution Paladins are a melee DPS that we regard as a hybrid of Brawler and Tactician. They don't have a ton of control, but they bring an immense amount of utility. Retribution spent most of the last few years stuck reliant on Avenging Wrath to deal real damage. Like we saw with Frost Death Knights, most Ret Paladins yearned to dive into the fight and throw down, but lacked real impact outside of their setups. Retribution found new life in Season 3 of Shadowlands, with the addition of the tier set bonuses, which allowed Retribution to zug with the best of them and embrace a more brawler-oriented style. This archetype has made it into the Dragonflight tree. At the same time, options exist for a more traditional 60-second build based around Execution Sentence and Final Reckoning. If Ret Paladins draw the short end of the stick with regard to tuning, they may become dependent on setups for kills as we've seen in the past. But if things go Ret's way, it'll have access to the best of both worlds, fun and meaningful consistent damage to go with impactful burst. Holy Paladins are a healing specialization. Of all the healers, they remain the spec most defined by efficient cooldown trading. They have a massive kit of buffs to support their teammates. Holy Paladins are able to flex between interactive and non-interactive playstyles. This is what we call offensive support. Holy is happy to stay in the backline, but when they get an opportunity to hodge the enemy, they love to hop on their steed and charge in, even if it's technically a bad idea. In terms of updates in Dragonflight, Holy Paladins will welcome the return of Rebuke. This is a melee interrupt, and there's still a lot that could be done with it. Blessing of Seasons is interesting enough to warrant its own video, but for now, just know that this thing is super interesting. While we're talking about busted externals, ultimate sack on a 60 second cooldown, huh, that's it. That's all the reason you need to pick up Holy. We expect the core Holy Paladin playstyle to remain unchanged from Shadowlands. Holy Paladins have rarely been out of the PvP metagame throughout the lifetime of Arena. Their design is naturally very powerful, and Dragonflight hasn't done much to undermine that. 
priests are a cloth-based class with the ability to either heal or DPS. In Dragonflight, priests receive a lot of incredible utility on their class tree. Talents like Void Shift and Twins of the Sun Priestess were niche tools that saw play but took up valuable slots. Now, Twin Priest in particular is extremely accessible and an incredible buff to priests. Though priests say goodbye to Greater Fade, they gain the ability to use both body and soul and angelic feathers. We also see the return of Void Tendrils and Fade as Snare Removal. These are big quality of life improvements that are accessible to all priests. And of course, Mind Games is an incredible utility that came to define all priest specs for a good portion of Shadowlands. Notably, priests are the only healer without access to an interrupt in the class tree. Jumping into the specs, if you heard anything about Shadow Priest during the Dragonflight beta, it was almost certainly negative. Misery, inescapable torment, and screams of the void are all things you see when you visit the Priest class forums. However, there is a reason Priests are so invested in their class. Shadow Priests are a ton of fun and have the potential to be incredibly powerful. Shadow's Dragonflight tree supports both conventional Shadow Priest setups as well as tempo-based rot playstyles. Mind Bomb is gone, but Shadow now gets easy access to Psychic Scream on a 30-second cooldown. Shadow Crash now applies Vampiric Touch to targets. When combined with Misery, this allows the Shadow Priest to immediately get their DOTs rolling against a melee cleave without needing to cast. On the other end of the scale, Mind Spike is returning to the game as a basis for a hard cast build, and because it's on the Shadow Frost school, it can cast it even after being kicked on Shadow. At this point, there appears to be a lot of potential for a Dark Ascension build that can bang targets with massive modifiers on Mind Games, Mind Blast, and Devouring Plague. For what it's worth, exploring Shadow Priest was some of the most fun we had during beta, and at least one of our writers was convinced to go all in on Shadow Priest as his main after that experience. Disc has historically been Priest's definitive PvP healing spec. It's a healing spec that's built around absorption effects and generating healing through their damage. Discipline is a great example of an interactive healer. Disc is at its best when they push in with their team, support their DPS with Dark Angel and PI, before spamming out damage and CC. There are two broad ways that we expect Discipline to approach Arena in Dragonflight. First is an Atonement-heavy build that leans into burst setups. This involves making use of Shadowy Covenant, Schism, and Mind Games to pump out a huge amount of damage in a very small window. This is going to be familiar to players who remember Schism shenanigans from late BFA. The second is a far more healing-oriented build that we would categorize as less interactive for our healer archetypes. By dropping mind games, the priest sacrifices significant offensive value, but gains a ton of potent tools to protect themselves from getting trained. An archetype like this resembles the Wrath model of Discipline Priests. Discipline has lost Shadow Mend, which provided a second healing spell school and has defined the spec in PvP for years now. Though this is absolutely a nerf, the Void's been filled with a variety of instant cast holy spells. Combine that with Void Tendrils and Fade Snare removal, and Disc is far from helpless when dealing with melee cleaves. We expect Discipline to flex between an emphasis on offensive and defensive builds and playstyles based on the matchup. Holy has been floating around the PvP meta for a number of years now, particularly in 2v2 Arena. But its biggest moment in the light was undoubtedly Season 3 of Shadowlands, where it dominated all modes of the game. We lost count of how many times Holy was hit with the nerf hammer, but it just refused to go away. It revealed just how much Holy could infringe on Discipline's identity under the right circumstances. Holy was conceptually a non-interactive healer, but was able to outdisc disc in Season 2 in terms of its offensive play. Holy has received a ton of changes that take away crucial tools from their MVP season in Shadowlands, but remains among the highest damage-dealing healers. Though its burst is not as high as Discipline, the newly implemented Imperial Blaze fills a similar niche and can be executed much more easily than Disc's Schism setup. Tuning is a major concern for Holy. If it's a viable healer, it may see play because of tools like Holy Word, Chastise, and Censor, which provide Holy with a ranged crowd control that Disc lacks. Rogues are specialist melee DPS. They're typically defined by their control, 
and all rogues have the ability to turn invisible, as our three rogues are demonstrating here. In Dragonflight, rogues have finally learned to share, but only with themselves, naturally. Abilities like Cold Blood, Shadow Dance, and Acrobatic Strikes are now available to all three specs. Let's get into the specs. Subtlety is the signature rogue PvP specialization. It's the ultimate tactician. Sub is not typically known for its consistent pressure. Instead, it's a spec that thrives off the back of its control and its ability to create setups. This is done through their signature offensive, Shadow Dance, which gains a cooldown reduction through deepening shadows as well as a second charge. This allows the rogue to be unpredictable. They aren't on a static timer like Windwalker. In recent years, Sub Rogue has built its damage around amping up Eviscerate through talents like Dark Shadow and Finality. It would seem that an archetype like this would stay the preferred option for most Sub Rogues. With all this emphasis on discipline, control, and synergy, Sub may struggle in the madhouse of Solo Shuffle. Sub can be versatile in how it plays RMP, but it cannot necessarily be versatile with its comp picks. If you stick a Fury Warrior and a Sub Rogue together, things might get a bit weird. Assassination is a rogue specialization themed around bleeds and poison effects. You know, assassin stuff. Since assassination is built around damage over time effects, assassins generally put out consistent damage, rather than the controlled bursts of sub. In recent years though, assassination drank the Shadowlands Kool-Aid and embraced all-in sepsis goes. This style of setup has been incorporated into the core Dragonflight experience for assassins, through their new offensive cooldown, Deathmark, Assassination bursts by amping up their bleed and poison effects. This combines with Exsanguinate, a talent that's been around for ages but never saw wide play, as well as Kingsbane. By tying your pressure to dots, your burst can't be peeled in the same way. By the time Deathmark's rolling, it's too late to peel the rogue. That's a huge benefit. However, there is a huge drawback. Bleeds and poisons can be removed with relative ease. Mending Bandage, Cauterizing Flame, Bitter Immunity. Hell, Dwarf is likely to see a lot of play, so Trinket Stone Form could ruin your day. If Assassination is reliant on its burst, this is a major hurdle for the spec. But Assassination is demonstrating awesome consistent pressure at the time of this writing, and is looking to be the preferred PvP spec for launch. Outlaw is a pirate-themed specialization. As a pirate, you aren't above cheating or stealing, but you at least have the decency to look your victim in the eye while you do it. Keeping with that theme, Outlaw is the closest of the rogue specs to a brawler archetype. We classify them as a hybrid because they have a tremendous amount of control and disruption, but are rewarded for staying in the fray. Outlaw's defining element is Restless Blades. This reduces the cooldown of a huge range of their abilities based on combo points spent. This means that the spec has a lot going on, it's a challenging spec to play well, but very engaging. Outlaw has been nerfed quite significantly in Dragonflight. Seven second kidney shots are a thing of the past. The conduits Outlaw relied on are significantly weaker as talents, and the loss of legendaries and tier bonuses really hurt them. This means that the spec lacks the magic that it had in Shadowlands. That is, until you press Dreadblades, at which point the spec comes alive. And thankfully, Dreg Blades is now affected by Restless Blades, so it's up very often. There's a stealth-based build for Outlaw that picks up Shadow Dance. The build is interesting, but we aren't crazy for it at this point. We don't expect Outlaw to take PvP by storm in December, but the spec will certainly remain playable for those who fell in love with it over the last year. Warriors are a plate-wearing tank or DPS. They're typically among the most popular melee DPS in Arena. For essentially the game's entire life, arms have been the staple PvP spec for Warriors. It's always had brawling in its blood, but we categorize the modern arms warrior as a hybrid between brawler and tactician. The reason for this is that arms just bring so much control and utility to the table. All these tools make a good arms warrior extremely impactful when it comes to disrupting the enemy's setup. Even when arms warrior damage was kind of bad, this utility toolkit could still keep it in the S tier. There are a few obvious archetypes on this tree, notably an execute based build. There's also a tie to blood archetype, which we are certain is going to take the ladder by storm at some stage. But for now, the standout build for PvP appears to be a fairly standard Mortal Strike and Overpower build. 
This build feels solid. It's exactly what you want from an Arms Warrior playstyle. You rarely rage starve and the damage output is solid with pre-release tuning. At this point, Arms Warriors have played with pretty much everybody. They love a good Klee, but also thrive when paired with a caster DPS. And finally, Fury is a melee DPS defined by its frantic pace. Fury's gameplay is one of the most thematically appropriate of any specialization. Warriors have a one second global cooldown baseline, which is reduced by haste. You end up with so much haste and so much going on, the amount of inputs is unreal. Here's cast per minute of some logs from the raid on beta. It shows the number of inputs on each spec in a five minute window. For DPS, it's not even a contest. Fury has historically been the baby brother to arms in PvP. In the final two seasons of Shadowlands, off the back of the new tier sets and a new Mortal Strike effect fresh from the oven, Fury had undoubtedly its most dominant season of all time. What made Fury so successful was its unrelenting pressure. Fury had high passive movement speed, a ton of gap closers, and high uptime on their major offensive cooldowns. And it wasn't a gimmick spec. Fury could play the long game, and Dragonflight, the essential core of that build, remains. Fury Warrior's biggest weakness was dying in stuns. Defensive Stance and Invigorating Fury are both strong additions in that regard. Interestingly, the ability to use their wall and self-heal while in a stun may actually make Fury better at surviving a setup than arms. If Fury's going to succeed in Dragonflight, it won't be off the back of complex setups. It's just a question of whether Fury can bonk people on the head hard enough. There's a charm to that simplicity. Shaman are a hybrid male class with the ability to DPS as melee or ranged or specialize in healing. Disruption is a core theme of all three specs. No matter your spec, as a shaman, you love to disrupt the enemy with kicks, purges, and control. Dragonflight offers shaman a variety of interesting new ways to make their enemies miserable. Starting off with the obvious, Thunderstorm and Lightning Lasso are now available to all specs. Elemental Orbit allows the Shaman to have two shields on themselves at the same time, which creates the possibility for new interactions with Unleashed Shield. All Shaman can now knock a target back into an immediate four-second route, and notably, they can do this from 20 yards away. And if that wasn't enough, Gust of Wind is also making a return. Interestingly, the design of the Shaman Clash Tree doesn't follow you toward the bottom of the tree. The capstone talents aren't as powerful as some of the other classes, which allows the player a lot more flexibility to sculpt the precise toolkit they bring to any given matchup. Shaman may be the best example of a dynamic class tree because there's so much powerful utility that's so easily accessed if you want it. Enhancement Shaman are melee DPS who are themed around empowering, enhancing if you will, their own weapons as well as their teammates. In Shadowlands, low damage saw them become pigeonholed as a support in the same vein as Protection Paladin. They were an off-healer and source of disruption, and to be honest, it kind of ruled. Enhancement is one of the most enjoyable melee specs in the game. It feels snappy and can do well as either a gimmick burst spec or as a more consistent brawler. Enhance got hit with a massive nerf in the final month of beta, so a lot of people have written off Enhance. But screw that, man. Make it work. The Shaman talent tree as a whole has been praised for its wide range of possibilities. If any class can innovate their way out of bad tuning, it's Shaman. And remember, as a support, they can piggyback off of high-performing DPS, such as Warriors. We also expect them to be hugely impactful in solo shuffle due to their off-healing capability. Elemental Shaman is a pure example of the wizard archetype. They love to just do damage. Elemental Shaman are extremely flexible. Over the years, they've inhabited all sorts of different archetypes. They've succeeded with Ascendance builds, Ice Fury builds, Stormkeeper, and Lightning Lasso combos. Elemental has had a huge variety in how it goes about winning games. Our content manager described the Elemental playstyle as ratty, which was odd because no one had mentioned Elemental Shaman at the time. But it's not strictly inaccurate. Elemental Shaman thrive with the disruption that the Shaman kit offers them. Enemy casters hate them. Enemy melee fear them. While the spec might experiment on Elemental Blast, it has a significant amount of damage tied to instant cast Lava Burst, with Flame Shock offering huge Maelstrom generation for Earth Shock spenders. To players familiar with Elemental Shaman, this tree really does feel like a greatest hits album. There's very little here that'll shock you, 
but all the staples are here. Restoration Shaman are interactive healers who thrive off the back of momentum. We already talked about the disruption of Shaman, but Restoration may be the spec that embodies this idea the most. While Resto Shaman no longer have a monopoly on an interrupt as healers, it arguably remains the strongest and most useful of any healer. Their ability to spam purges, snares, and other forms of disruption has always been powerful. Blizzard has balanced this by limiting Resto Shaman's throughput. They have a harder time keeping health bars filled, so they need to prevent damage through tools like Grounding or Earthen Wall Totem. For this reason, they do their best when their team is on the front foot, when the enemy is scared of the Shaman's team and can't get their offensive game going. If the enemy team can't do their damage, the Shaman suddenly has a much easier time, and the Shaman can help create this situation through their own offensive play. If we do see the meta shift toward a more consistent damage pattern, we can expect to see Resto Shaman really shine because their offensive pressure can influence the game at basically any moment. Warlocks are a specialist ranged DPS. Despite being a caster, it's become a core part of their class fantasy that they're extremely durable. In Dragonflight, quite a few staple abilities are returning or are becoming more accessible. Amplify Curse has been a PvP talent since Shadowlands, but never really saw any play. It's been elevated to the main tree and is a very easy pickup. And I mean, just look at this thing. A 40% casting speed reduction, an inability to crit, this thing is crazy. On first glance, Soulburn is just an interesting little piece of defensive utility. But the gateway interaction is an enormous quality of life improvement. Certain combination of maps and comps would prevent the Warlock from setting up their gate. Soulburn also helps the Warlock keep their demon alive. This is part of a suite of talents aimed at helping the Warlock's pet survive. Affliction is at its most pure when it's generating pressure through rot damage. This is when the Warlock applies their damage over time effects to all enemies and is able to slowly compound pressure. This has been the definitive Warlock PvP fantasy for most of the game's life. Tragically, this style of damage was out of vogue in Arena for a number of years, and so Affliction struggled. However, all signs are pointing to Dragonflight rewarding consistent pressure, so Affliction looks really promising. Particularly in Solo Shuffle, where coordination is low and you have the ability to crank up the temperature with immediate dampening. Soul Swap makes a return to the game. This version of the spell applies all your dots instantly. Again, this is a solid quality of life change. We want to talk about a Soul Rot archetype briefly. Soul Rot was a core affliction tool in Shadowlands. This ability made it onto the Dragonflight spec tree alongside Soul Eater's Gluttony, which takes one second off of Soul Rot CD whenever UA ticks. This is balanced for PvE, where only one UA can be ticking. However, between Rampant Afflictions and Rapid Contagion, you can get the cooldown of Soul Rot pretty low. Demonology is a specialization focused on summoning and commanding demonic servants, from lowly imps to a goddamn pit lord. Demo locks can call them all into service. In terms of offensive play, Demonology is a surprisingly versatile spec, and over the years, they've killed us with Fell Lords, Implosions, Demon Bolts, Demonic Tyrants, and even just a bunch of particularly spooky dogs. All these archetypes have support on the Dragonflight tree. Demonology has quite a bit more control than the other two specs. In addition to the baseline Warlock CC, Demo gets Axe Toss, and don't forget second Axe Toss. So, while Tyrant builds are somewhat dependent on casting to get their damage out, Demo has the tools to set up their own burst in a way that destruction can often struggle to match. Demonology locks are extremely reliant on their pet. The additional tools to protect the pet will be much appreciated and go a long way toward improving the demo lock experience. Destruction is all about fire and brimstone. It's a spec based on good old fashioned hard casting. Destruction Warlock is defined by massive chaos bolts. The spec typically thrives in double caster comps where the casters can each support the other. Destro has often been a frustrating caster to play, since you're so reliant on casting to do anything. It incentivizes the enemy to make you miserable at all costs. However, there's quite a bit of instant cast support available on the tree. Backlash sees a return to the game for the first time in eight years with a six second ICD. It's stronger than ever. 
There is support for a version of a fire-based build similar to the old Cremation Destro build from Legion. There's a lot of support here for some brutally fast Chaos Bolts. In particular, Madness of the Azakir is a ton of fun to play with and works beautifully with the way Destro locks often get their damage out. There's also some just wild possibilities here involving Soulfire or Infernals. Our time with Destro was the most fun we've had with the spec in a long time. We can't be confident in its tuning at the time of the writing, but believe the toolkit is there for a powerful wizard.